What we see three to five years from now is a fleet of tens of thousands of these machines deployed around the world that are partnered with their human work teams, and they're able to get far more work done and to do it far more safely. We worry a lot about how robots are going to replace us and take our jobs. We don't think as much about how robots will help us and do dangerous jobs for us, help us avoid getting electrocuted, crushed, or maybe falling from heights. That's what the Guardian XT is. It's made by a company called Sarkos based in Salt Lake City. Guardian XT can weld, it can cut, grind, lift up to 200 pounds. It's controlled remotely by an operator wearing a motion capturing garment and controller. It kind of looks like it belongs on a Tesla manufacturing line, but it's mobile via Lyft or other vehicles. And it just got a big 5G integration upgrade. To learn more, we're chatting with Ben Wolf, founder and CEO of Sarkos Robotics. Welcome, Ben. Thank you, John. Super happy to have you here. Tell us about Guardian XT. What is it? Guardian XT uh, is a, an industrial robot that has the ability to move the way humans move with their upper body. So when we talk about dexterity, we talk about being able to do all the kinds of tasks that humans do with their arms and their wrists and their hands and to do it in a way that keeps humans out of harm's way. So think of it as a robotic avatar, if you will. We all kind of know what avatars are in the digital world. Think about this being in the real world, where in this case, the robot goes and does the work for you in the dangerous or difficult environment at height or in a confined space. And the robot follows you and performs the motion and movement that you ask it to directly and immediately. That sounds so science fiction. I'm wearing something and I move my arm and the robot arm moves and everything, but it's also so natural, right? I do exactly what I want it to do. I think we see some uh, applications in medical robots for surgery that have similar things like that. You're basing this off an existing robot that you have, which is the Guardian Exo, an exoskeleton. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and you bet. What we realized as we were developing over the last 20 years, the Guardian Exo, which is a wearable full body robot. So it's, you know, everything you can imagine in a full body, full sized human scale robot, except you can wear it. You get inside it and it allows you to lift up to 200 pounds with no stress or strain on your body at all. And what we realized as we were bringing that product to market is that there are some applications where our customers were wanting to do things like put our exoskeleton in a bucket truck so that heavy and dexterous work could be done at height. And we started thinking to ourselves, well, why do we bother with the legs on that robot? You don't need the legs. In fact, you don't even need the human to be in the bucket anymore to be able to lift 200 pounds. Let's take the torso and the upper body and the arms of the exoskeleton, put it into the bucket truck, and then keep the human down on the ground to be able to manipulate and direct what the robot does up at height. And that spawned a whole wide variety of interest from a lot of different industries because number one, so many people get injured doing work at height. It's more expensive. It's more time consuming. There's injuries involved. And the same thing goes for doing work in, for example, nuclear power plants. Might not be at height, but you're talking about situations where humans shouldn't be exposed to those kinds of environments. So what if we can take a robot that can follow our most direct direction and do those tasks in those kinds of environments, keeping humans out of harm's way? And that's, that's what our whole focus was. So the exoskeleton is about having a human in the machine, in the workplace. And the Guardian XT is about those environments where you don't want to have the human inside. And instead, you've got a robotic avatar. You have gone full on avatar. Hey, I mean, they you got the exoskeleton. That's in the movie. You've got, <laughs> you've got the remote teleoperation. That's in the movie, kind of. Uh, very interesting. I hadn't seen on your site anything about the nuclear uh, reactor application, but that is really interesting as well because you have remote operation, because we've seen robots used in high radiation scenarios before. We've seen that, for instance, in Japan, where they have that ongoing issue with that one uh, reactor that got devastated by a tsunami. But they have an issue because they have sense of electronics on board and that gets fried out. It might be a little bit better to have teleoperation because you don't need as many sophisticated electronics. The brain doesn't have to be on board. Is that correct? That's exactly our, our whole concept here is that we're leveraging the best of what humans can offer, human intelligence, wisdom, judgment, with the capabilities of a machine. And so it's kind of this combination of man and machine to get the best result possible. And so we're relying very much on human intelligence. Nothing about what we do today is about artificial intelligence. It's all about human intelligence and, and finding this great synergy 
between what the best of humans can offer and the best of machines. Where do you see XT being most useful? What industries are you looking at? What kinds of jobs will it do? I think, you know, first and foremost, as we launch this product at the end of next year, we're going to see real applicability in the construction industry, uh, doing things at height, whether it's uh, welding and sanding and grinding and cutting and all of those kinds of things that you see construction workers doing either in bucket trucks or on scissor lifts. Um, you know, anything that's an elevated platform, we can now do that with keeping humans safely down on the grass. I also think we'll see it in the power industry. Uh, so doing things like limbing trees over power lines, maybe even getting to the point that we're managing uh, some of the fine motor still work that needs to be done on the top of the power plant. When you talk about doing things like transformer installation, removal, replacement, uh, insulators, those kinds of things, those are all things that are highly dangerous jobs. And I'll tell you, one of the things that many of these industries that we're working with struggle with is it's hard to attract young people today to go into these physically demanding jobs that are dangerous. I mean, all of these industries are having labor challenges. So if now we can attract young people to say, you know what, you can still do this really cool work, really meaningful work, but instead of having to be at height in a bucket truck, now you get to stay on the ground where it's safe, you can stay dry, and you can manipulate the robot because it's the one doing the hard work up in the air. So power industry, construction industry, even the, the infrastructure inspection, doing things like inspecting elevated pipe joints in, in chemical plants. You know, oftentimes you have to put scaffolding up and get humans up 30, 40 feet in the air with sensitive devices to be able to determine whether the infrastructure is, uh, is, is solid, whether it's performing as expected, whether it's, there's defects or deficiencies. Now we can keep the human on the ground and have that work being done by the robot at height. I found it so interesting you're talking about construction and robots because that's been an industry really resistant to the introduction of robots, not because they don't want it necessarily, but it's so hard. It's such a dynamic environment, having a robot learn where to go, what to do in this constantly changing world construction. There's new materials here. That building wasn't there yesterday, right? You know, that's a really challenging space to work in. And if you can help with that, I think that's really, really interesting. What's kind of the status here? Uh, when is this shipping? So we've just done some of our first field deployed alpha trials where we've gotten our alpha version of the machine out with customers. I've uh, got great feedback. We're taking the feedback that we got from those customers and incorporating all of that into our beta version, which is in the design process now. We expect to have the first beta units completed towards the end of this year. We'll go out and do the same thing. Again, each trial, trial and trial with our customers. Make sure we're hitting the mark with what their needs are, what their use cases are. And then our expectation is to start low rate initial production at the end of next year, getting the first commercial units out in the field that, uh, you know, the, 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 it seems like every week that goes by, we get more use cases, more customers from different industries saying, well, if it can really do that, or I've got three things that it can go through. So we, we love getting the robots out in the field and getting customers to experience it firsthand. This episode of Tech First is sponsored by my creator coin, Dollar Smart. Don't think of it like Bitcoin, think of it like a backstage pass at a concert. Get some at rally.io slash creator slash SMRT to pitch me on podcast guests, earn weekly rewards, get social amplification, and get or give feedback on strategy and plans. Are you building that with sort of an extensible platform as well? I know that some industrial robots, uh, you can take an arm off and put a different arm on for different attachments. You talk about fine motor control as well. And it, it, are you thinking in the, along those lines? We are in a number of respects. We think of it being a modular robot in terms of the bases that it can affix to. So whether it's a scissor lift or a boom truck or a teleoperator or even a rolling mobile base that doesn't need to do anything at height. But like in the nuclear power plant example, where it just needs to roll around the floor. So it's modular in that respect and customizable in that respect. In addition, the end effectors or the hands, as you were just referring to, we're coming up with a version that is an actuated three finger robotic hand that can grasp a lot of different kinds of tools. But we also recognize that may not be the choice for all applications. And so we will have a version of this machine that will have the ability to swap out tools on a quick disconnect basis. So that when the three finger end effector isn't the right solution, you might want to attach a saw or a welding torch right to the wrist and do the job consistently with that type of approach. Amazing. I can see that working. You're talking about limbing trees or something like that. Just attach a saw and there you go. Right. Um, very, very useful. What do you need 
on site to make guardian work? Like what kind of power supply? Um, how's that run? So the robot is entirely powered by lithium ion batteries. Uh, so there is, there is nothing required on site. Um, this is such a, an incredibly extensible uh, platform because you've mounted on whatever your mobile platform or base is, and it's all self-contained from a power perspective. Uh, so we can put the, the combined base on a truck, roll it out to a job site and immediately deploy it with no customization or infrastructure required on site. Amazing. What kind of uh, charge does it have? And are those quick swap batteries? The batteries are hot swappable and in the field without even powering down the machine. Uh, we get about two to three hours of runtime out of the machine today between charges and we ship every unit with an extra set of batteries. So again, when you think about being able to swap them out in 10 or 15 seconds, you can have effectively unlimited runtime with this machine. Amazing. Amazing. We talked a little bit about the fingers. Uh, the full name of the robot is Guardian XT Highly Dexterous Mole Robot. How dexterous are we talking about here? What kind of fine motor control are you thinking about building into this thing? First and foremost, think about how dexterous the arms are. Um, the fact that the arms have the same kind of range of motion as humans have. And in effect, we've built the machine to be patterned after the way the human moves. So that it's what we call kinematically equivalent to the human body. So what that means is when you're wearing the control device and you just start moving your arms or your limbs the way you would normally do so in the real world, the robot just automatically follows. You don't have to think about managing the robot. And that's because of the level of dexterity that we have. Then when you get to that, to the hands or the end effectors, it really does get down to a specific tool or job that is being uh, deployed for. Uh, and again, it really just depends on what that tool and use case is. But we expect to be able to do all of the old same kinds of things that humans can do, but with the safety and precision and strength of this robot. So, you know, I couldn't be in a bucket truck lifting 200 pounds with my own arms, but this robot can. I love it. I mean, we're in a human world. We're in a human designed world. The trucks we have, the tools we have are designed for humans. So if you've got something that uses tools like a human, fits like a human, has its reach and extensibility like a human, it works in that reality. That makes a ton of sense. I wonder if you could project out for us a few years, uh, maybe three to five years or so. What does this look like? How capable is it? What is it doing? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll really focus on kind of that, the three to five year period. I think that we've got a machine that is so intuitive to use. It becomes a natural part of the workforce. Um, you know, our, our customers will put these machines on their payroll, just like the humans, and it becomes part of a work team. So we don't actually sell the machines. We provide them as a service to our customers, um, just like it is a unit of labor, but it's next generation labor. And it's a true partner with its human operator. So just like we think about other types of machines that are used in construction industries or the power industry, where there's an operator involved, say thing in our case. And so what we see three to five years from now is a fleet of tens of thousands of these machines deployed around the world that are partnered with their human work teams. And they're able to get far more work done and to do it far more safely. That's amazing, Ben. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, we talked before this show about the wildfires that are raging through the Midwest, the Pacific Northwest, other areas. Uh, we've seen flooding in Turkey and in, you know, fires in Greece and all over the world. We've got a uh, need to drive solar, a need to drive a lot of different alternative forms of, of energy and a lot of work to be done in the world. And a lot will be dangerous and in remote areas. So the more of this sort of solution that we can get, the better. You've added 5G capability and we didn't actually talk about that yet here. I forgot to ask you, what is the point of the 5G capability and how does that make it more useful, more capable? So I mentioned before how important it is for this machine to be intuitive to use. You don't want to have to have the operator think a lot about managing the machine when they're also doing a dangerous job, right? So they want to be able to focus all of their attention on the job. Well, we accomplish that today by having very low latency in the machine and the communications link between the human operator and the machine. And we achieve that today with a fiber optic tether because we can send the control at the speed of light the control signal at the speed of light. And as a result, it feels very intuitive, feels like a natural extension of the human body because there's no delay in what the operator does versus what the robot does. If we try to deploy a wireless solution over something like three or four G today, there simply isn't the bandwidth 
to be able to provide the operator with that same kind of no latency experience where it just feels like a natural extension. So we're excited about 5G. We're excited about a partnership with T-Mobile because they have a tremendous 5G network with a lot of bandwidth that is really specifically designed to be able to address these kinds of high bandwidth applications that we have. It is, it is a perfect application for 5G. So now instead of having to have a fiber optic tether, between the human operator and the robot. Now we could actually have a situation, as long as we've got our high bandwidth, low latency 5G network available, you could theoretically have somebody on the other side of the country managing one of these robots uh, or a fleet of these robots. And that's really where it gets exciting. You start seeing some exponential gains in the use cases and applicability when you can maybe have you know, a, a handful of robot operators sitting in a control room in one part of the country and they're managing a fleet of these robots doing dangerous and difficult work in another place. It's really interesting to hear you say that because um, I was just thinking of, you know, sometimes you're in a Google Doc or some form and you're typing and it's not showing up at the same speed because <laughs> your internet's bad or something like that. And how many mistakes do you make on a simple job like typing out a simple sentence because you can't don't have that direct immediate feedback? How much worse could that be? You're working on a power line, you're working on a dam and you, you're going to hit stuff, you're going to break stuff if you don't have that immediate feedback. That makes a ton of sense. Ben, I want to thank you for your time. It's been super interesting. Great. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate it.